Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Catalyzing Podcast. Really awesome, unique topic today that we're going to talk about healthcare in the industrial setting, specifically Nick Usuriello, who is a certified athletic trainer who works in the industrial setting for Pivot Onsite Innovations, which is a, a company uh, within the Athletico umbrella. And Nick serves a um, food manufacturing company um, in the industrial setting, and, and he's done a really great job of building a team approach to healthcare. So that's what we're going to talk about that, that today. So Nick, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. Good morning, Ryan, and thanks for having me. And you look fantastic in that vest. That's a great color for you. Thank you. The uh, high visibility is a must here on site. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. So um, thanks for taking some time. Just uh, real quick, what was it that sparked your interest to serve as an athletic trainer in the industrial setting? So as a uh, collegiate athletic trainer, uh, I was kind of looking for an alternative as I started my family. Uh, mm -hmm. just to get some better working hours so I could spend more time at home uh, helping my wife out. We were in an area where it was just us. We didn't have any other family around and very few friends. Uh, and looking to move a little bit closer to family, I kind of stumbled upon uh, some industrial-based jobs and inquired into them. I wasn't sure how much I would like them coming from a you know, highly intense collegiate setting, mm -hmm. working with athletes and being out in the field and traveling around with them, uh, coming into more of a, a workplace. Uh, environment. Uh, but after touring the facility and seeing kind of what my role and responsibilities were, I realized that I'm doing the same type of thing. I'm helping people do what they want to do. And in this case, doing what they need to do to make a living and pay for their own lives and families and maintain their own status uh, as opposed to being competitive in a sport per se. But it's the same kind of work, just in a different kind of atmosphere. And that's powerful when you think about it that way. You know, sports are, are of course, sports are important in life. They're a key part of, of growth and um, recreation and professional um, for a lot of people. Uh, when you're providing healthcare in your setting, it's a little different because these are people that are going to work nine to five or whatever their shift may be. And their family income depends on their ability to do their job. And if they get hurt on site, that could be a, a life changer for them um, with paying their bills and whatnot. So I, I really appreciate how the importance of that, like you mentioned. Sure. And it goes beyond just occupational injuries as well. Mm -hmm. We're allowed to deal with any personal injuries to help our employees deal with anything that's going on in their lives. So say you sprain your ankle in your driveway outside of work. Well, that's going to affect you at work too. So mm -hmm. that becomes some of our responsibility to make sure that we're not affecting their work. So they're allowed to keep making their paycheck coming in you know, sometimes we can make some minor accommodations through the HR team just to get them through that brief stint. But then they're doing their rehab and follow ups with me here on site, as opposed to having to make time to go visit a physical therapist or go to a doctor's appointment and, and get you know referred, which, as we know, can take a process. Sometimes people can't get into their primary doctors for two to three weeks sometimes. Right. You know, and then it's an urgent care visit or an emergency room visit where they can just stop in and see me because I'm right on the production floor. Mm hmm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is basically you serve as a guide for the healthcare of the staff members when they work there, not just trying to prevent and reduce the risk of something happening, but also when something does happening, guide them in the right course of action to keep it from getting worse or to manage it and, you know, see the right person appropriately. So that's uh, that's a very rewarding role, I'm sure. Um, you already mentioned this, the, the power that it has on keeping people working in a healthy manner but you know what, what else is rewarding about that particular role that you play well sometimes it just comes down to the the gratitude that you receive from someone in terms of you know maybe they're a little bit older there's people of all ages here i have people that are 19 years old and i have people that are up to 74 years old and some that are just hanging on trying to get the last couple of years of work in uh, and then they can have a nice retirement after that and sometimes those older gentlemen and, and older women are just extremely grateful that you were able to help them with a you know a small muscle strain or a sprained mm -hmm. ankle or you know a minor laceration that they're afraid of becoming infected or I'm not sure if they need stitches for. Um, and that's where we come in. And that's really the healthcare side of this, which we yeah. see a bit more in terms of dealing with referrals potentially. And, and we can basically monitor and, and as an outside contractor working in a different facility, there's no conflict of interest on my end. Uh, with the site itself and with the, the facility that actually runs this place. Uh, I can make the best recommendation for the individual, despite what the company may want <laughs> in terms of 
uh, the food manufacturer. Absolutely. And that's why, that's why they h- hire third party contractors like from Pivot Onsite Innovations mm-hmm. to come in and be this role in their facility. Awesome. Thank you for painting that picture uh, of your role there, which is really powerful, very essential um, in the workplace. And you referred to situations where you might have to refer out or that you might have to work collaboratively with others. And that's really what I want to focus on of our conversation today is the the relationships that you have centered around you with kind of you being the the hub. And then you yeah. got all your spokes of all the different resources, administratively, um, medically, and other professions. So when you first were getting started there at your site, tell us about some steps that you build that you took to build rapport with those other stakeholders and the team members being that you were new there, um, being that you were playing a, a valuable role, what are just some specific steps you took to build rapport and enhance your relationships with the people that you would have to collaborate with on a regular basis? Sure. And it was uh, advice given to me by one of my superiors in Pivot. It's like, spend your first full week outside of your office, be on the floor, be on the production, every aspect of it, from the actual production into the warehouses, into the front offices, get to meet people, talk to people, figure out where their heads are you know, figure out what their idea is of what I can do for the facility, you know, because a lot of times people don't know, you know, right. especially frontline employees who are out there working the, the eight hour to 12 hour shifts. Management may have a better idea what I'm coming in for because they're part of the reason I was hired, but they may not know everything that I can actually do for the facility. And having a bunch of other certifications and, and tools in their arsenal are very effective and because uh, it falls a lot into our scope of practice of what we can do here on this site. But the first two days, I was not in my office. I was fully out on the floor. I was getting to know some of the people on the first shift. Because uh, this is a three-shift uh, plant. It's run 24-7. So you have to do this kind of process throughout the three shifts mm-hmm. to get to know as many people as possible. Because uh, there's night management, there's day management, there's evening management, as well as all the employees that go along with that. So making that presence, you know, just hanging around, talking to people. I actually, as much as I could, got in and I, I tried the jobs myself. Mm. And that way I was able to figure out, okay, where are the main stressors? And I tried to spend an hour or two doing each job task to really feel what the employee is going to feel, especially a new hire, because that's one of the ones that you, you mainly consider as one that's at risk for an onsite injury mm-hmm. um, in, in their first two months, really. Talking like tendonitis, muscle strains, some minor stuff that can arise just from the repetitive motions that some of the tasks are. So if I was able to experience that and feel that, I would have a better idea of things that I could potentially put into place to reduce that risk or trainings that I could do uh, to help people to become better acquainted with their surroundings, with the tools that they're required to use on a daily basis, the personal protective equipment they might be required to use. Mm -hmm. So there's less... Um, chance that they're going to get injured while they're doing their jobs. So once I got to experience that, then I can turn around and, you know, I took lots of notes. I took some pictures of areas that were of concern. And then my first task were, let me develop a plan of action and how to kind of combat some of these more at risk issues in terms of ergonomics and biomechanics. And then once I was able to determine some of those key points, that's when I start to meet with management on site and say, Hey, here are some of our higher risk areas. Uh, and, and this goes back to looking at injury trends from the prior years as well, as much as data they have available. So we had, I had one year's data from the year prior from where I started here, just to kind of review and see where some of the major injury wars look for any trends and then bring it to management. Hey, this is what we're seeing. Uh, this is what you've seen already this year. Here's some, a couple ideas of how we can change either the equipment, the tools that people use or some of the positioning and just knowledge that we give to the individual about this job. Maybe sometimes it's just switching hands while they're doing a task to reduce the stress on one arm. Maybe it's the introduction of a new ergonomic tool to reduce the risk of maybe a shoulder injury or a wrist or hand sprain uh, based on the positioning they have to get into to maybe clean a unit, um, you know, just things like that. And then that's where you start to build your inroads with management because now they're seeing, okay, you're in the facility, you're investigating all of these things. Uh, we can tell that you're here for the betterment of our facility. And then that's how they get to gain their trust in you as well. It's so crucial. And you, you, um, what I'm hearing there is basically you, first and foremost, you wanted to walk in their shoes. You wanted to understand. You didn't come in and just say, hey, I'm Nick. This is how I'm going to do things. We're going to do this, 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 and this. You came right. in and you understood what was going on outside of your room. You dove in and you understood the jobs. You talked to people. Um, you built relationships with the people that you're serving in a sense, uh, which is so valuable. And I really appreciate that you did that. 
And then what you said is that you spent some time looking at the what is, you know, what are the stats from before? What have been the problems there? Again, before you just come in and give a problem solution, you have to understand the problem. And it sounds like you did a really great job of diving into that, looking all the different factors that, um, that go into injury risk and whatnot. And you did that because you, you know, I can tell, and just from speaking to you before, you genuinely, genuinely care about those that you take care of there. And first and foremost, it was, here, I'm here to help you. How can I help you? What are you looking for? Um, what has been a problem in the past? Let's work together, come up with a solution. And then you went back to the administrators and you kind of had that big picture. So that's a really awesome approach. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, injury prevention is always the goal. Whether mm-hmm. you're in collegiate athletic training or in secondary schools, whether you're in a health clinic or in this industrial type setting, if we can prevent the injuries from happening, everyone's happier at the end of the day, the employee, Mm -hmm. the company that they're working for, and myself is one less person that I might have to deal with because I was able to get out there and prevent them from having this difficulty to begin with. So, and with our mastery of biomechanics and kinesiology as just from being an athletic trainer, it fits into this site because we can observe motions and postures and watch as they're squatting or maybe doing repetitive wrist and hand motions and say, Mm -hmm. that's a lot of extension going on there in the wrist. I bet you're going to have some extensor tendon issues at some point, or you may be a higher risk of a strain because of the way you're doing this task. And that's why when we walk around on the floor, we also do a variety of job coaching and just biomechanical assessments of individuals to say, hey, you're at greater risk because of the way that you squat here. Let me show you how to do this properly. And then ideally that they take that to heart and they incorporate that into their new daily routine. Awesome. And I think those principles are applicable. I mean, you're an athletic trainer, but whatever your medical profession or wellness profession is, if you're serving in this setting, you take those same approaches and principles of you build relationships, you understand the processes, you understand what the challenges have been before, whether you are uh, an occupational physician, a nurse, uh, a wellness practitioner, um, like a fitness uh, professional who comes in to do prevention programs, it's all the yeah. same, kind of the way you painted that picture. And and you're right. Those skills that you bring, um, once they have an understanding that you care about them and you understand them, then you layer in, here's how I can help. And that all the stuff you just mentioned with your skill set, your background and whatnot. So that's that's a really powerful approach to build, build rapport relationships and kind of get your foot in the door there. Who do you normally collaborate with on a regular basis? Um, you know, whether it be the injury reduction strategies that you implement proactively or the post-injury care, who are just some some common job titles and, and roles that you collaborate with on a regular basis? So in terms of injury reduction strategies, it's usually more department-based. So in, in the food facilities, you have multiple departments, but there's some common ones that you can find throughout many facilities, like maintenance teams, sanitation yeah. teams, you know, anyone that works in a, in a type of warehouse. And they all have their individual you know, floor-level managers, and then there's the upper-level management. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll address the team workers themselves, then go to their next direct supervisor, which is usually the floor level type manager, Mm -hmm. discuss things with them, see what they hear, what they've seen, Uh, because sometimes they have to jump in and do the work too. You know, so what did you feel when you did this? Or do you think there's a better way? And the more subjective feedback you can get, a lot of times that can play into whatever change that you might think needs to be made, which then you can bring up a level management and say, hey, here's the feedback I got. Here's the injury trends, um, and here's the reason we need to change this. And then, you know, being the the masters of this field that we are, we can propose several different types of changes. Some of them on the ergonomic level, some of them on the engineering level, where we actually change maybe the workspace to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, some maybe on the training level, um, where we just train individuals to do it in a different way, or maybe we inter- introduce a new tool that they use uh, to do their job a little bit better and with a little more accuracy and less risk of injury. And then once you collaborate all that data, you bring it to the management, they pretty much well, you start with the department level manager, and then they'll bring it to the bigger management group uh, and then discuss the potential options of, of what makes sense to do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when you build that trust up, you're involved in those conversations, you know, yeah. that, that higher level stuff as well in terms of, okay, this is the one that we're thinking of going at. What level of impact is, is this going to have and how difficult or easy is this going to be to implement? And then you can kind of give them a hierarchy scale of it's going to be this easy and 
potentially this difficult based on you know money, time, the engineering, maybe designing a new tool or a new piece of equipment, you know, and then they can kind of weigh the odds from there as what they would like to do. Um, because we're here more of as a support role than anything else. We can't really dictate the changes made, but the more options we can provide, right. the more that the more potential that we have, they're going to pick one that we like already. Yeah. And it's going to benefit the employee more than um, suit the manager's needs, so to speak. Of course. And you you have to keep both sides in mind. You have to keep the, you know, when you're presenting those solutions that you, that you want to recommend, number one, it's great that you're, as a healthcare provider, you're taking feedback and insights from someone who's not a healthcare provider, but that knows that job, that setting better than you do until you kind of get further down the road. Um, but then also you're thinking about it in terms of the benefit for everyone, a win-win solution versus, well, if we do this for this side, but this side is going to lose out. And that's not ever really what we what we want to seek, you know. So you you take that approach to explore about collaboration. Yeah, because there's the production aspect of things when you work in any facility like this. There are the numbers to think about, even though that's not our main concern. It is the main concern of the of the management. Right. Exactly. So your change has to both benefit the safety aspect and the production aspect, and there can't be too much, you know, leeway in between. To some degree. The nice thing about it is the more trust that you gain with the management, the more likely they are to know that this change is absolutely necessary. And mm -hmm. regardless of the time we might lose, this is what we need to do. Because as you develop more in your facility, they, they tend to put more safety over production. And that's really the goal at the end of the day for everyone. The safer you can be, the more production you're going to have anyway. Maybe you lose a little time here or there based on ergonomic changes that we have to make to keep the employees safe. But the less lost time that you're going to have from employees missing work because of injuries, you know, the less restricted work they may have, you know, maybe mm -hmm. restricting their duties because of it. And at the end of the day, you're going to have more production because the fact that you're going to have less people injured and less people out of work. Yeah. And we have to keep in mind, it is a business. It, it's yeah. a combination. It's the people in the business. But um, ultimately, when you put all the strategies in place and the things you're talking about, that ends up creating better business metrics down the right down the road you know less liability uh less re recordables um for uh work workman's comp type situations less right. job loss time loss injuries you know so that's that's powerful that you're speaking to that and then they also you know the fact that you keep data you keep metrics etc that helps you to build your case for the things that you're doing in-house that that's working so that's that's really important what about outside of your facility you know who do you collaborate with whether it be at pivot on site or you know local um, resources who are some people that you might collaborate with either on a regular basis or an occasional basis to help you be more effective in your job and to benefit your people that you serve so one of my first goals was starting here for the outside group was who are we sending people to when they need to go to a doctor. And in New York, we can't direct care. Yeah. So we can't tell someone to go to a facility. However, when you do have a relationship with a facility, with a set of doctors, um, people are more willing to go because we know them. We can get them in for appointments quicker. We can go with them to appointments on occasions, you know, and we can get them to see sometimes even the same day, which is yeah. rare in this day and age. Um, so the first goal was in this area was who is gonna work with me? Who deals with occupational injuries? Uh, and who can I establish that relationship? And that took some time. Um, there were plenty of, of medical facilities in this area that are not willing to work with occupational injuries because mm -hmm. no one really wants to deal with OSHA yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and workman's comp. There are just some larger policies in terms of you know, the medical side with insurance coverage and, and money payback and, and everything like that that a lot of, of medical facilities can't, de can't deal with or just don't want to deal with. Um, so there were very few options to choose from in that regard. Uh, but we, I was able to find a good one that works with us. Um, they're very quick to usually get people in. They have an urgent care side to them as well as an, an occupational office. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if the occupational office is closed, they can still go to the urgent care side and get that same care from the same company. Uh, and, and all the paperwork is you know, transferred over with medical releases and whatnot. And they have you know, my paperwork on file there for medical release. So that information can come back to me and for continuance of care and coverage. Uh, for that individual so whatever they recommend over there then i can start to carry out on this end in terms of their rehab and treatment plan for on site um, so and, and then in terms of actually my own company pivot on site innovations we have direct managers 
as you would in most companies, you know, in, in collegiate settings, we have our head athletic trainers, our athletic directors, a very similar uh, idea in this company. Uh, you don't meet with them every week, sometimes every other week. You do a, a bigger team meeting, usually once a month, just to get a recap on what other facilities in the same scope we're doing. We can kick ideas around to each other. And that way you get to know other athletic trainers that work in the industrial setting build yourself a bigger network of people you can reach out to when you might have some issues or, or specific injury risks coming up that you may not know the best way to deal with. And you can reach out and see if someone else has had a similar problem at their own site and say, Hey, how did you handle this? Or what did your management think when you proposed this to them? You know, were they open to that kind of idea or not so much? And that way you can kind of rule out things or maybe even you know gain, gain some new knowledge on an idea that you may not have had yet uh, from one of your own um, coworkers. And that just makes you stronger overall in terms of what you can do on your own site. It's nice to feel, I'm sure, that you're not alone. Like even though you have your own site, you're a part of a bigger team and you have those resources that you can reach out to for second opinion, for ideas. Other people that have done this for many, many years, you know, uh, what their experience has been like or similar settings across the country doing what you're doing. So that's really crucial. And that, you know, that carries over whatever kind of setting you're in. If you are in an organization where there's multiple locations, it's so crucial for that organization to set up opportunities for team members from those different locations to occasionally interact, to build relationships, to be a resource for one another, especially if it's like real small teams. Um, you know, or like yourself, you know, you're there by yourself. It's just so crucial to have that network, that spider web of support. And uh, it's really great that you have that in place. Because in the day to day, I don't see anyone from my company. Mm -hmm. You know, the face to face time with versus actually in person meeting with my anyone from my company is very rare. Yeah, <laughs> we're spread out we're very far. Um, and it's just not possible to actually meet someone face to face yeah. right now. So using platforms like this uh, to interact with people and, and, and hold meetings with and, you mm -hmm. know, just phone call, you know, just in general communication with other coworkers makes that bond for you. Um, and it's just like similar, if you're working at a secondary school, you're probably the only athletic trainer there. And you might be contracted through a PT clinic or, you know, some other subdivision of a medical care system, but you're usually there by yourself. But same thing, you have occasional countenances with uh, your own team members, but you know, on maybe a more rare basis. It's very similar in that regard. The nice thing about it gives you a lot of autonomy to do what you need to do on a daily basis mm -hmm. in terms of your own particular facility. So as much as you don't work for the plant that you're actually assigned to or the facility you're assigned to, you interact with them a hundred times more than you do with your own company because that's just the nature of the job. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you have having that balance of <clears throat> autonomy to be effective in the way that you feel is best for that site combined with the structure and the support of the umbrella and the resources so that you're not necessarily alone. And they provide, you know, resources, I'm sure behind the scenes for you to be more effective, to save you time, to, to not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, that that's how it works really well when you have a bunch of different locations and you have team members spread out so you have that balance of autonomy and structure and, and resources. Yeah. And, and a big part of that you alluded to it is you use things such as zoom as meetings to build relationships and whatnot. What are some other strategies specifically that you found helpful to nurture those relationships to ensure a smooth collaboration, whether it be the people on site right there uh, in the, the yeah. leadership or the team members or local resources or the you know other pivot on-site team members like what are some strategies you found effective that have helped you so i'll start with the local one because that was the, the biggest challenge is uh what can i do to bring this company to that company basically and yeah. and and get that relationship built and the best thing i found was after a phone conversation was setting up an in-person meeting where I actually went there, representatives from this company went over to that medical facility. We met with the medical directors there, all the higher ups in the business office, explained what we were looking for and explained how we could mutually benefit each other in terms of, you know, potentially providing, you know, you know continuance of care with them, as well as being a, ref a referral, more or less, uh, to try to get some people in to see them as well. Uh, but that really face-to-face -face interaction, going there, showing that we care, and then 
in certain cases. We didn't do it here, but I know you can get them to come into your facility as well. Uh, so they can see what you're actually dealing with. Because you get someone in front of you, they try to explain their job to you. And if you don't know anything about that job, you don't really know what to recommend in terms of, all right, do you need to be out of work really? Do you lift over a certain amount of work a day? Maybe not, depending on what you do. But if you get them in the facility, they can then see, okay, this person's not ever lifting more than five pounds at a time because that's not what their job entails. So therefore, they wouldn't need any accommodation for this. Or, okay, I see what they do. So if I need to tell them they need to do any kind of rehabilitation, I know you can do that with them and keep them working because of the taping techniques you can do, the, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, supports that you can give them uh, and things that can keep them going throughout the day. Right. So it just you know, gives them that overall or overarching theme of, okay, I are now understand what you're trying to do, what your facility is about. And then from our side, we now understand that you know what our needs are in terms of what we we're asking from you from a medical facility. Um, that face-to-face -face interaction carries over into management and everyone here on site too. I send a lot of emails. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of injuries that need to be communicated about. And the, any occupational injury needs to be known about by the direct management of that site and then as well as the director of the site and the, the safety team that we have here on site. So everyone knows how to best accommodate, understand what the situation was. And if there's a change need to be made, an investigation can be done into what happens specifically to root out if there's a root cause uh, that we can try to solve it. So to prevent that injury from ever happening again in that area. But after the initial emails go out, I like to do a lot of my follow-ups with management and, and floor level management face-to-face. -face. So they can see they're not just reading an email or I'm hoping that they're reading an email mm -hmm. it's saying that someone needs you know, an accommodation or this, or they, they need to be icing every two hours during their shift you know, and just hoping for the best when I'm not here on site. Uh, if I can make that personal connection with them and say, okay, this is an individual, this is what um, is going on with a few words to, maintain as much confidentiality as as we need to mm -hmm. uh, you know this is what this is what you need to be providing for them because of this injury that they had and then that really face-to-face -face interaction i can really explain it they can ask questions which i found is the most important part mm -hmm. because more often than not people will just say okay when they read an email and kind of go about to their own devices but if they give them a chance to answer questions without having to reply to an email i find they're more willing to ask ask questions uh in person so having that personal aspect as well. Um, and in some cases, we do it with everyone. The team member that was injured is there. The management is there. And I'm there. And we kind of all kind of have a group table discussion about what you feel like you can do, what I'm suggesting and recommending as a healthcare provider, and what management has in terms of your job title as to what you can do in that realm. So definitely those face-to-face -face interactions, I think, are key to really building and keeping that rapport high and not letting anything slip through the cracks. I appreciate that. And so kind of in summary, what I'm hearing you say is first and foremost, you you focus on the relationship again and you say, how, you know, how can I bring us together? How can I help you and reinforce that? You kind of go out of your way to 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 make it about them. Uh, which is so crucial. Um, you enhance the communication approaches, whatever platform you use, you ensure that you are doing things to be clear with your communication. Um, and then you're following up on that to ensure understanding because there needs to be mutual understanding and shared expectations. So you, you mentioned about how you follow up on that you know, with a face-to-face -face or maybe like a, a, a Zoom uh, meeting uh, if it's offsite. Uh, for be able to, to see someone face to face because a lot can be lost in text um, and written word and you can maybe get more clarification when you can interact with each other in a visual way. And then you sure. also talked about having everybody involved for that the next stage as well, which is crucial. You're not not kind of going around people, you're involving all stakeholders, if you want to call it, um, so that yeah. there's understanding on all ends of what needs to be done, who owns what. And so that's a really powerful approach to, to nurturing those relationships and to ensuring that collaboration is smooth, reducing the risk of breakdowns in communication, misunderstandings, all that stuff that sidetracks us. So nice job, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. It helps awesome. hold accountability as well. You know, yes. on all means of it, you know, just because the direct <laughs> manager knows doesn't mean the upper level manager knows what's going on. And so that mm -hmm. way everyone's in the loop. Nobody's blindsided to what's happening and everyone has some accountability in making sure that this person gets better. Who yes. Knows? Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. So one last final call to action, you know, for, for others who are currently in 
working in the industrial setting as a healthcare provider or those who are looking to get into that area? Um, you know, what would you say is like the words of wisdom, you know, something that you would say, keep this in mind as you're starting that journey or as you're expanding that journey for others? One thing I would say is this um, type of work in the industrial setting is good for anyone who's been a long-term athletic trainer or fresh out of school. But the one thing you do have to be aware of, it's very different from working with athletes. Mm -hmm. just more like working in a clinic with, with PT patients. Uh, just how you have your clinic, you have your office. But the nice thing is you don't have to spend a lot of time in your office. You get that outside exposure as well. Mm -hmm. So kind of like the collegiate setting, every day has the potential to be different, which mm -hmm. is which is nice in, in my regard, is that there's something new to investigate. There's something new to try out, new people to talk to and speak to and figure out you know, if their job needs to be improved to some degree uh, to fit their mood. Um, but don't be afraid of this either. It's it's scary. I know when I first walked into the facility and I was told I need to wear all this protective equipment because it's a food facility, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this every day. You get used to it, mm -hmm. you know, and just don't be af afraid to jump in and talk to people. You know, athletic trainers are great at communication. We're yeah. great at getting out there and meeting people and, and discussing things with yeah. people. And this is exact, it's exactly what you need to do in this type of field, in this facility, is to make sure we're getting out there, talking to people. You know, if there's language barriers, having someone translate for us. Um, because at the end of the day, the more people we know and talk to, the better we can help everyone at the end of the day. And that's really what we're trying, trying to do here as athletic trainers in the healthcare facility. The more people we can reach and help, the better that I know I feel at the end of the day that I was able to make a difference in some people's lives. And it's the same thing, no matter the setting for athletic trainers. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in the industrial setting, investigate it, go visit a site if possible, if you know someone, uh, but don't be afraid to explore it as a potential option um, for your skill set. Yeah. maybe a life change for you. That's what it's all about. It's about helping others and, and that's a powerful thing. So uh, Nick, Nick, your surveillo, thank you so much for, for joining us. Your email will be in the show notes if anybody has any follow-up questions. Um, and of course, anybody uh, listening also can definitely check out um, Pivot Onsite Innovations, their information on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. Um, you can also connect with Nick on LinkedIn as well, but um, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your strategies and uh, you know, good luck to you as you, you move forward in your career. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me and I appreciate talking to you this morning. Absolutely. Fantastic. Have a great day. Thanks too, Ryan.